world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Words of life, words of hope, give us strength, help us cope in this world where we roam. Ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true. What a good way to bring, open up the morning. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here this morning, to sing together, to praise you. Um, you see all of our hearts. You see where we are this morning, where our thoughts are, where our desires are. Would you just prepare our hearts over the next several minutes to be changed by you, to be transformed into your image. Uh, we confess um, <laughs> distracted minds, and we, we want to follow you. We want to, to be changed by you, and I pray that you would use this time to do that. In your name I pray, amen. We'll all be seated. It is really good to see you all this morning. I don't have a a lot, um, but something that I, th I think will be interesting to you. This last weekend, um, a group of women from our church went to a ladies' conference in Clark Summit, Pennsylvania, the Life Conference. I know we talked about that last week. Um, my wife came back excited, and we haven't had the full debrief yet, um, but she had a lot. And so um, some details that I thought were, were fascinating, and I would say very encouraging, the group uh, was 20, so we had 20 women from this church heading down to Clark Summit. 
20 states were represented. There were 702 women. That's how you know they're being precise, because they said 702. And there was 122 groups. But I think that the neat part was that at a certain point in the conference, they called up a, the leader of the largest group. And the woman who went up might be familiar to you because it is the wife of our, of our pastor here. So we had the largest group of all of them. So just, just really encouraging to see um, people coming together, having fun together, learning, and uh, hopefully growing and changing. So um, there, is a, there is another slide, but we're going to talk about that uh, later. So that's all I've got. We are going to sing about our great God like we do every Sunday. And uh, these words come from Psalm 18. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. He is worthy. Amen? Amen. Let's sing to him. God has reached for me and pulled me from the raging sea and I am safe on the solid ground the Lord is my salvation Glory be to God, 
Join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the, the privilege, just the blessing that it is to be able to, to gather this morning and join our voices in praise to sing truth to you, truth that we understand that comes from your revelation of yourself. It's, it comes from your word. Um, but it's truth that, that, that brings change. It's not just facts and it's not just information. It's, it's transforming truth. The, the, the ancient words of your word that when we study and, and understand, we can believe and apply. And, and your Holy Spirit can use that to, to transform us, to change us, to, to draw us closer to Jesus, to... To, to encourage us and to, to challenge us, to confront us and convict us. It also brings comfort to us and a, a peace that passes understanding, a, a, a shalom that we have from you, a well-being, because it tells us of who you are and what you've done to, to redeem us and to forgive us of sin, to make us brand new, to, to make us your children. It also reminds us that you are absolutely in control, that you are the sovereign Lord of the universe. You're still on the throne. You always have been. You always will be the one eternal God. Holy, 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 completely righteous and just and pure. No evil. As for God, his way is perfect and not only that, you're almighty, you are all powerful, you are sovereign, able to bring to pass that which is best, whatever you choose. And you're loving, and your love is loyal, and you're gracious and merciful. And, and Father, we could just continue to go on and on to praise you as we've already begun to do through these, these songs, through reading your word. You are so worthy, and it's our desire to glorify you and, and to come before you and to, to thank you for who you are and what you're doing in our lives, to admit from our, the bottom of our heart that we need you, that we want to trust you. We want to get to know you better because that will lead to us loving you more. And, and as we know you and love you better, we, we want to want what you want. We want to trust you and obey, not because you're twisting our arms or, or pushing or forcing, but, but because we love you and, and you deserve all the praise and exaltation. You deserve lives that are, are, are lived in conformity with your will. And, and we surrender to Jesus, our Savior, afresh and anew. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would, would fill us and, and that each of us would examine our own hearts, even right now, and, and turn from sin and, and confess anything that's distracting us and pulling us away from you. Things that have, have maybe become elevated in our lives to improper priority. And, and whatever it is, Father, we ask that you would have free course and that your spirit would use your word. And it would bring about change that brings you glory because you are worthy and change that would continue to take place throughout all eternity. We bring our needs before you, the needs of our community, the needs of our world. We cast those cares upon you and ask you to work in and through these things for your glory to accomplish your purpose and all that is going on all around the world on a global scale and here in our community and in our homes and with our families at school and at work. Just remind us again that, that you're actively involved in all of these areas of our lives. And forgive us for those times we don't acknowledge that. Forgive us for those times where we don't yield to you and your spirit to, to control us and empower us. So that we're used by you to plant seeds of the gospel. We're used to by you to demonstrate your grace and your love and your mercy to people that are hurting and grieving and confused. 
were used by you to encourage and build up believers and challenge them to grow even deeper. And Father, that's our desire today. We ask for your leading upon this church. We thank you for the, the wonderful conference that these women attended and the way you used your word in their lives and how you connected them together. May, may the decisions that have been made continue and, and may it lead to sharing with other people and continued transformation. And, and, and Father, we just come before you and we cast all these cares on you. We cast these praises on you. We exalt you and lift you on high and thank you and ask you right now to use your word in our, in our lives. Give us the grace and the strength to respond so that it gets applied into everyday life and you draw us closer and closer to our Savior and Lord Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Nate mentioned that there was a, another announcement, and Gretchen, if you want to put that slide up, probably, that um, he was mentioning. We've, we've been talking about, um, as far as our, our worship team, um, an opportunity to do something special that we haven't done in a long time. I don't know that we've ever done that, and, and that is uh, on, on Jul June 8th at, at 6 p.m., we're going to... Um, gather together whoever wants to and we're going to come upstairs and it might be hot and sweltering. We'll, we'll open the windows. Um, but we're just inviting anybody and everybody to come worship God as we spend some time in what we're calling a hymn sing. Grieg's going to be leading us. Cheryl's going to be playing the piano. And, and you can come. And uh, we're, we're going to even pull out those hymnals that should be under some of our, uh, of our chairs there, especially if you want to want to sing some parts and harmonize and things. And, and we're going to give time for some favorites. Um, Grieg's going to put together some of them, and we'll have that as a structure. We'll probably read some scripture. We'll spend some time in prayer. Um, and we're not trying to say that, that, that hymns are, are better or worse. Or <laughs> The whole idea is we don't always sing as many of our old hymns. And I believe a lot of people would enjoy that time of worship. So we're inviting one and all, whether you're young or old, it doesn't matter. And we're going to get together on June 8th. That's a Wednesday. And so it's right after the, the ladies' Bible study. It goes from 4.30 to 6. There's just a handful of you that are in that. Most of you are involved in the morning session. But there's five or six of you as part of that. So that'll culminate. We'll come upstairs and just worship and encourage one another and sing praise to God. So think of some favorites. And I'm going to extend one other thing. This has been mulling in my mind for a number of weeks, a few months. I shared it with the, the elders a number of months ago. And they said, go for it. Let's try it. And, and we'll just see who comes out and, and what takes place. But one of the thoughts that I've had as well is some of you might want to put together even some special numbers. Maybe there's some of you just have been having this heart to do a, a duet or a trio or a quartet or a solo. And, you know, not so low that we can't hear you. You know, that type of thing. Um, th th this whole idea of coming together and, and singing, making a joyful noise, noise to the Lord and and just praising him with a hymn sing. And based on how the response is to that, maybe every four to six weeks, we'll try to schedule another one and, and just get together and see how the Lord leads that. So if you have some questions, you can catch up with me or Grieg or Cheryl. If you would like to prepare a special number, touch base with Grieg and, and let him know so that we can just put it on the schedule and, and we'll just get together for a hymn sing. Sounds great, doesn't it? We're invited to come and we want you to join us on Wednesday, June 8th. Along with that, a number of you have been already asking, it's pretty nice outside, Mark. Hey, I'm wearing short sleeves, right? Are we going to go outside again for summer worship? And the answer to that is yes. I got some of you to bite there a little bit. Yes, the, the plan right now is to have our, our relaxed, informal worship outside and the planned Sunday for that to begin is the Sunday after Father's Day. 
and, and it'll continue through the summer. Be praying for our worship team and not only praying for them as they prepare. That's a lot of work and going in and out and all the stuff that they do. But one more reminder, and as we get closer and closer and closer, they are the ones that determine whether we're able to stay outside and worship on that particular Sunday or not. And they're watching their weather on their phones and they're seeing what's happening. And they're making these decisions by 7, 730. Do you understand? So they can get ready and everything out there. And you might show up at 930 and it's sunny, but it was. Get, do you understand my point? Let's be sensitive and encourage them. The beauty about where we are right now in our world is if we can't meet out there, we will meet downstairs during the summer. And we can, whereas before that first summer, God was so wonderful. Not one Sunday did we miss because of bad weather outside. Now, last summer, it was about 50-50, if you remember. But please, if you've got a, a bone to pick, pick it with me. Not with Dave or Greg or Bob or whoever's making those decisions because they're doing the best they can and I'm so grateful that they're willing to do that. We'll also be putting some schedules um, up for our backyard gatherings. We'll have at least four of those through the months of July and August coming up where we fellowship on a Sunday evening and, and, and worship and spend a few moments in word and, and have a great fellowship dinner together. So those are things to, to be exciting, excited about, things that we're looking forward to as God leads. One other thing that I'm going to mention in there is we, and I apologize to those who have expressed interest, we will be scheduling a baptismal service. And if you have an interest, it'll be taking place in the next few weeks or in the next few, sometime between now and into the summer. And if you have an interest in following the Lord and believers' baptism, please connect with me, catch up with Nate, and just let us know so that we can meet together and put you on the schedule for that that's going to be taking place. So exciting things going on. Looking forward to what God has in store. You know, we've been going through this whole big picture um, of the Old Testament right now, you know. Uh, the Anna Jim JJK split crisscross OT survey. Those are that's an acronym to to, to help us to, to to basically remember the twelve main events through the Old Testament timeline. Okay, and and we've come to a conclusion with that. Um, the last couple of weeks we've looked very briefly, but the the whole idea of the the events taking place after the Babylonian exile, as God has brought His people back to the 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 land, not all of them. It's just a remnant. It's a, it's a very small group. They have rebuilt the the temple, and and no, it's nothing like the glory of Solomon's temple hundreds of years before. But the temple has been rebuilt. They have begun to worship. Um, there is some spiritual reformation taking place as Ezra is leading the people. And then God leads Nehemiah to come back and build the wall around Jerusalem. That is all taking place at the end of the, the Old Testament timeline. Do you, do you understand that, that that's where that is happening? And what we've basically said is, is that the first 17 books of our Old Testament, what they do is they lay this historical timeline and then the, the other books, the five poetic books, the wisdom books, and the 17 prophetic books, they fall within that timeline. And so we've got a, a little bit of a chart that might help you get a little bit of a picture of the timeline, beginning in Genesis with, with creation. And, and we started back there as we're, 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 we're reading the Bible through in 2022 and finding God's worldview for you. So it's not just facts and information. We're learning and believing and applying so it brings change to life. And the biggest way it changes is to change the lens through which we see our world. And what we've been learning through this study is over and over, God's people bought into the world's 
big picture, to, the, to, the, to lost people's world's view, to their influence. Do you understand? And they walked away from their God over and over and over. And his grace and his mercy is real and, and, and kind. And there is forgiveness, but there's also times of discipline and judgment. And, and so we've traced that all the way through um, to not only the, the United Kingdom under Saul, David, and Solomon, but then the kingdom divides northern kingdom, southern kingdom. And, and you know, this has taken place, and we, we hear about in First and Second Samuel, may, mainly Saul and David there, but, but then in First and Second Kings and the Chronicles, we, we hear about this divided kingdom and the northern tribes, and they're taken by Assyria in 722, and about 140 years later, um, Babylon comes and, and, and overthrows and, and destroys Jerusalem, the temple, the wall, and, and takes the bulk of the people into Babylon, 586. And they're there for about 70 years. And, and there's three waves coming back into Jerusalem, and that brings the, the historical timeline to a close. And you see that um, Ezra, you've got Ezra, Esther, and Nehemiah, because probably the events of, uh, of Esther take place in the middle of the book of Ezra. You know, um, and so you have that. There's the timeline, right? We've got that. We've got this big picture. But now we're going to turn the page and start looking at that next section of books that we find in our Old Testament. And there are five of them. And those five books we would call the, the wisdom literature. And so they're going to fit back in there if you were to look at that. The, the wisdom, you've got the timeline and the history in the first part. The wisdom literature primarily is going to find itself in the time of David and Solomon. So you can see it on the chart where they are written and, and the events that they're describing and things. So they don't add anything to the timeline. Do you understand? That's already set. These are words that are inspired, ancient words like we sang this morning, inspired by God to these men to be written for us, and they're written in a different style of literature. It, most of the, the wisdom book, the, the five books there, are wit, written in what we would call poetic language. And there's comparisons and contrast and metaphors and similes. There's figurative language. And yet, the events that they're describing quite often take place in the midst of literal things happening. You, you have Nathan confronting King David with his sin of Bathsheba, right? That's recorded for us in, in 2 Samuel. It's a historical, literal thing. But then we get Psalm 51 as a result where, where David pours out his heart in confession before God. And the way that he writes it is, is almost like a song. It's a psalm. It's, it's, it's a poem. It's, it's figurative. And yet it's based on literal things. And it's, it's real. So you, you don't take the figurative language and say it's just all symbolic. It's just an allegory. No, there's benefit and there's truth. And, there's, and, and here's the beauty about the wisdom literature that we're going to consider for the next few months. You're finishing Esther if you're on track with your Bible reading. And as I said last week, if you're not, jump back in because tomorrow you're going to start reading in the book of Job. We're going to turn the page into this wisdom literature. And the beauty of the wisdom literature is it's much like the first part of our worship service. This is a whole worship service. It in, worship is not just singing. Worship is praying. Worship is talking about God. Worship is studying his word. It's all worship. But don't you enjoy how it's different in the beginning when we can lift our voices in praise? And those songs are like poetic expressions. And they touch my heart, my feelings, my emotions. They draw me into the experience but would you not agree that the words we sing were literal words about historical things, about actual truth? It's not just fiction. It's definitely not fantasy. It's a different kind of literature that draws us in to feel what the author is experiencing. And I'm so grateful that God includes that kind of writing in his word. 
And so that's the next section in those next five books in our Bible, in our Old Testament. And then there's 17 more books that are come after that. And in fact, if you'll put those up, Gretchen, those 17 books we call the prophetic books. And do you see the balance and the order that, that people have put together so that we can understand God's word? If you just started in Genesis and read to the book of Malachi and thought it was all one day after another chronological, you'd be so confused. There's three sections in our Old Testament. The first 17 bucks lay down the timeline. The middle five books give us this poetic wisdom literature that we need. And the last 17 books give us prophecy. Now, again, they don't add to the end of the timeline. They are written during the period that we already laid out in the first 17 books. And we get additional information about what God is doing in that time period that we didn't get the details, all of them, in Second Kings and First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. So that helps us understand how our Old Testament's arranged. Everybody with me? And we're going to turn the page now and start looking at some of the wisdom literature. So open your Bibles, if you would, to the Book of Job. It's the first book that is included in the wisdom literature. And, and, and I've got some things that I, I want us to establish in this first time together. Um, you also understand what we're doing is an overview. We're not taking every book and going paragraph by paragraph. Though I'd love to do that, it, we never get done with this theme. Do you understand? We're giving you the skeleton, the framework, so that you can understand the books of the Bible and, and God's timeline and his plan, and you can see his worldview, his big picture for us. And what's coming out bold and clear is that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that we're lost, we need redemption, and the only way to be redeemed is through our, by grace, through faith, in God, taking him at his word. It's not in and of ourselves. It's not politics. It's not government. It's not social agencies. There's not one thing wrong with any of those things, but they fall short of bringing us into right relationship with God. And we need to understand that in the world in which we live. Are, are you, do, you, do you understand? Are you with me with that? That the real need for people, those things are good. Education and marketplace and social and civic and, and government, all of those things are good. But they fall short of showing us that we need to admit that we're lost because we sinned and believe that Jesus died and rose again and call out to him to rescue us. That changed heart is what makes a difference eternally. And it's the same picture begun in, in Genesis that's going to carry through to the end of Revelation. And so that's what we've been considering. And so now we turn the page to this, this idea of the, the, the book of Job. And, and, and as we do, um, we're going to have some questions. But read with me in, in verse 1 of, of Job chapter 1. We're going to hear about this man and, and hear about what's going to take place in his life. There was a man in the land of Uz, or the land of Uz, but it's not... Dorothy in the land of Oz, okay? It's the land of Uz, we'll say Uz. Uz sounds Uz, I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce it, but, but the point is it's, there's a literal land here described. There's a geographical location. Stay with me. There's, and there was a man that lived in the land of Uz whose name was Job. I mean, that's how most of us would pronounce If you're not used to the Bible, you would say job, right? And again, this is not Steve Jobs. It's not that. This is Job is how we pronounce it. Why? I, I don't know. Some of you can tell me when we're drinking coffee afterwards. But it's J-O-B and the man's name is pronounced Job. Okay? I just want to save you some embarrassment if you're discussing this with other believers. Okay? You know, the book of Job. Uh, it's the book of Job is how we pronounce it. His name was Job. And that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. Now, this is the description of the author of this book. Um, 
He's blameless, upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. He's right with God. What I believe is being described is is he is in a right relationship with his God. He has experienced redemption. He has placed his faith in God by God's grace and he is upright. He's he's living wisely. He's, he's, He's blameless upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. If a book was written about us, is that how the author would describe us? Again, an application and challenge and conviction. That's how Job is described, in right relationship with God and turning away from evil. Verse 2, seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 male donkeys, very many servants. And that man was the greatest of all the men of the east. There's a description of him. And the way that they're describing him is is honestly based on what I'm going to call patriarch economy. This is how people were described back, if you will, in Abraham's time. Do you understand? They, they looked at their wealth. They, they looked at their, their stature. They, they looked at their, their impact. And it was measured through these possessions and things. And if you remember reading back in Genesis, a lot of times you saw that described when the person was wealthy, um, had impact, right? Right? So just keep that as a mention there because we're going to tell you why that's important in a minute. His sons used to go to hold a feast in the house of each one on his day. And they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. It, it sounds like every day of the week they'd get together for a meal. One it was, it went from house to house in the houses of his seven sons. And the three daughters were invited to. And it's going to be a, a wonderful festive time. When the days of feasting, verse 5, had completed their cycle... Now look at this. Job would send and consecrate them, rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Now, there's another interesting fact there that, in other words, Job is being viewed, in essence, as the priest of his family. And he's being used by God to give instruction and direction to them. And in case there has been sin, he is offering sacrifices, burnt offerings for his family. We heard of Abraham doing that at times. You heard of Jacob doing that at times. Isaac, do you you understand? Um, These were people. Now, now what time, why, why am I making a big deal of it? Because... We do not know who wrote the book of Job. I I don't think, some people have said Job. Obviously, it's Job. He must have written it. When I get to verse 6 and we start reading, don't don't you look there. Look up this way. We're not there yet because that's something that's going to be very interesting. Something's going to be taking place in heaven that Job knows nothing about. It's pretty clear through the 42 chapters of Job that he, his four friends, his wife, do not know or understand that this took place in heaven before the events played out in his life. That's why I would say it'd be difficult for Job to be writing it, probably because it's clear that he doesn't know till the... In fact, I don't know that it's ever revealed to him, even at the end, and we'll get to that, and there will be a few spoiler alerts. I'm going to encourage you to to keep reading through these 42 chapters over the next two weeks. But but the reality is God is going to bring Job to a completely different place in his intimacy and his trust in God, and his trust in God is going to be the theme of this book. Because a lot of stuff is going to happen in Job's life that makes no sense from a finite perspective. There's going to be a lot of pain and a lot of suffering. That's coming. A lot of hardship and loss and grief. And one would think then that the, the, the whole purpose of Job must be to answer why 
Does God allow suffering in the world? Why does God do that? And I'm going to tell you at the very outset, that question is never answered. Why God does what he does in the affairs of people. Why does he allow suffering? It's not going to be answered. Let me just say it this way. It's not going to be answered in the way that you want and I want. Are you with me? It just isn't. So I'm giving you that up front. And, and keep that in your thinking as you read through this. So Job could have been one of the authors, but probably not. We don't know who it is. And, and there's part of me that almost wonders if that's part of the intent under the inspiration of the Spirit. There's some things that are left a little questioning so we don't get caught up in too many details and miss the point of the book, trying to find this and that and what this means. Because that's how we are as human beings. And when it comes to the topic of suffering, don't you always ask, why? Isn't that the first thing on our minds and sometimes out of our lips? Why? And Therefore, he's challenging us, don't get too caught up in that because you're going to be left hanging in that situation. I need you to see a far grander purpose, I believe, is God's point of this book. That when it makes no sense rationally, when there's no logical reason for this and that and events in our community over the last few weeks, events in our state, in, in Buffalo in the last, last week or so, events in our country, events in our world where there's no rational explanation, logical, because that's what humanity wants. We believe I'm entitled to that, that I deserve that, that... that and there's nothing wrong with trying to and, and, and looking. And sometimes we do stumble across truth and reasons. But when there's no rational explanation, I'm going to say one other thing. When there's no theological explanation of the actual why this and this and that. God says, trust me. No, be real right now. You don't like that, do you? We always say when bad things happen, there must be a reason, and I'll find it out, and I need to know it, and I'm entitled. How's that working for you, friends? I don't know how people make it if they don't have a relationship with the God that's described here. I just don't. I'm so thankful for his grace moment by moment by moment. Let me just read something here. It, this is out of a commentary by John MacArthur in his introduction on this book. Just, I don't usually do this, but let me just read this because I think it's going to help us as we move on. This book begins with a scene in heaven. I'm going to give you the spoiler alert. This is what's going to take place that explains everything to the reader, but not to Job. We have the benefit of reading what's going on in heaven. Do not miss this. Job did not have that. I think that's important for us today, thousands of years later. And it's going to be important for us to just trust him when I can't figure out, I can't explain, I can't answer the why. He says, explains everything to the reader. Job was suffering, listen to this, because God was contesting with Satan. Why? We're going to read that here in just a minute. There's a contest where, where basically God says, if you considered my, my servant Job and how righteous and blameless and stuff. And, and Satan basically says, does he serve you for naught? You've given him everything. Look at how blessed he is. Look at his impact. You take that away and he'll curse you to his face. And we'll get to that here in a minute. Job didn't know that's going on. I, I think that's vitally important for us as we study this. Job never knew that, nor did any of his friends. So they all struggled to explain suffering from the perspective of their ignorance. Ignorance, folks, please understand, it's not stupidity. Ignorance is they didn't know. Stupidity is knowing and doing it anyway. 
right? That's the difference. Ignorance is he didn't know. And so his friends are trying to explain why, and they're not, they don't have the ability to grasp it. They don't have the knowledge. They don't even know that this is going on. That in this courtroom, the judge gives permission to Satan to ravage Job. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. So they, they try to answer from their ignorance, the, their lack of knowledge, until finally Job rested in nothing but faith in God's goodness. And we're not going to see that in full till you get to chapter 42. There's going to be glimpses of it along the way because the beauty of what Job does for us is it shows us that here's a godly man. God said so. Not Job himself. God said he is. And he struggled with suffering, with confusion, with loss and grief and hardship. He's a godly man. And it doesn't make sense to him. Isn't that helpful for us? And I believe part of God's response to Job at the end, because he's going to rail on the three friends, he's going to condemn them because they're making decisions and, and statements out of ignorance. And so he's going to say to Job, go to Job and he'll offer a sacrifice in your behalf and they'll be forgiven. But it says about Job, God was happy with his responses. Now here's the thing, when you're reading in the middle section of this book, you're going to say, wait a minute, you're saying that God was happy with how Job was, with what Job just said there? I'm not saying that. Because you're going to also find at the beginning of chapter 42, if we get to it this morning, Job is going to retract and repent. He's going to admit that I tried to give counsel to the one and only who is all wise. Do you understand there's a, there's a humbleness in Job's? And so what, what basically God is saying, no, not everything that Job said was right and accurate. He's on an emotional roller coaster through it. You would be too if you're going to experience the loss that he has. I would be too. And so the questions, they're natural and why? And I don't understand. It's not just, are you really just? It makes no sense. These are... Let me just ask you, any of these questions gone through your mind in the last two or three weeks? You bet. And, and so what we're seeing is something important here because in the end, there's only one thing in which Job can hold on to, and that's God and his goodness, his attributes, his nature, who he is, and the hope of his redemption. That God vindicated his trust is the culminating message of this book. When there are no rational, as we said earlier, or even theological explanations for disaster and pain, trust God. We're trying to decide who wrote the book, and I already gave you way more than I needed to, but it's a good part of, not that I needed to, that we were supposed to get to. Um, I don't think Job wrote it. Some people have said that maybe Solomon wrote it. It's part of the wisdom literature. Do you understand? He wrote a lot of the wisdom literature. We know he read, wrote the, most of Pro, the bulk of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. He, he wrote a couple of Psalms that are actually given to him. Um, he could have been the one that God moved to write the book of Job. And, and that's why initially we, we, we put it where we did in the charts. But there's another option, and, and here's the idea. It could have been Elihu, who was one of the guys, the, the fourth friend, who's going to have a little better perspective in talking to Job in this section of this discourse of why this is happening, why the suffering, is God just in things? Could have been. It could have actually been Moses. And so, Gretchen, would you put that other slide? There's one more slide that you could put up there. And you see where we put Job way over there? Now, maybe it was Moses. Here's the point. I don't think we need to know who wrote it and when it was written. We know it was inspired by God, okay? And here's the point that I'm trying to make. One thing that would help you is if you did put it towards the beginning, like we said in the patriarchal times, 
What you have is a better understanding of the, the geography and the economy and the, the life that's going on. You're going to find out as you read the whole thing, Job lived. Anybody know how long he lived? All we know is more than 140 years because in chapter 42 it says, after all this calamity, he lived another 140 years. Abraham lived 175 years. Do you understand? That's why we're putting that. The economy, the, the donkeys, the camels, all that kind of stuff, the land of us, all these kind of things help us understand that no matter when it was written, by whom, the Holy Spirit wrote it for us and the events are probably taking place sometime after Babel. You know, Genesis 11, the disper when they disperse them, and Abraham. Are you, are you with me there? Because that's what's being described. So that brings us to one last question I want us to at least attempt to answer today. And we're not getting anywhere close. I thought we'd do this in two weeks. And it might be 22 weeks. But... Um, I've already said we're in the wisdom structure, right? That's the kind of literature. That means there's a lot of poetic language, figurative language. You, you understand what I'm saying? But just because, let me explain how the book of Job lays out. The first two chapters of the book of Job are historical narrative. They're written in what we call prose. I don't know, you don't need a literature lesson, but it's prose is the different is different from poetry. Are you with me? Poetry is figurative, symbolic, poetic language. Prose is literal manner, historical. That's what we're trying. So the first two chapters give us the introduction to the book of Job, and they're written in historical narrative. Then you go from chapter 3 all the way to the last chapter, 42, and halfway through the first six verses. That segment, the bulk of the book, listen, is kind of this dense Hebrew poetry. You're, you're going to see when you're reading it, as you turn after to chapter 3, it's going to look like you're reading in Psalms. They're in those, you know how it's divided up in our scriptures. There's poetry. It's, and, and, and here's why. I, and then you get to the last six verses of, of chapter 42, and it goes back to historical narrative. There's the conclusion, the historical prologue. So it's, it's led some people to say Job was not a real person. It's all figurative. It's all poetic. Do you, do you understand it? It's an extended allegory. Um, if you choose to believe that, that's between you and God. But I'm going to give you some, uh, some information to, to suggest that even when poetic language is used, as we said earlier, quite often it's based on literal events taking place. You find one psalm after another of, of David crying out because Saul's chasing him to kill him. But it's written in poetic language because it's emotional. It draws me in. I need this. I need to feel this. I need to be a part of it. It doesn't mean it's not true. It's not literal. And, and so I want us to understand there are other places throughout the scripture where that would make sense. But there's one other thing. Turn with me, if you would, to the, to the book of Ezekiel. You said, I don't even know where that is, Mark. Just start going. You got Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. And then you've got the, the major prophets. And Ezekiel's one of them. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations. And then I think it's Ezekiel, Daniel. So that's where you are. Turn in Ezekiel chapter 14. And he's one of the prophets that God is raising up to speak to his people. He's talking about false teachers. He's talking about how bad his people are and the need for judgment. On God's people. That's part of Ezekiel chapter 14. And these are at the beginning. There's the, uh, the, the rebellious, idolatrous elders are being confronted. And they're being condemned. It's a time where God has raised up this prophet to speak to his people. To say they're headed down a path of no return. Right? Kind of like we read at the end of 2 Chronicles last week. There's no remedy. At this point there's only one solution. Captivity, exile, judgment. 
So he raises up Ezekiel in this time. Look with me at verse 12 of 14. Then the word of the Lord came to me, that's Ezekiel saying, Son of man, if a country sins against me by committing unfaithfulness, and I stretch out my hand against it, destroy its supply of bread, send famine against it, and cut it off from both man and beast, if this happens, even though these three men, Noah, Daniel and Job were in the midst. By their own righteousness, they could only deliver themselves, declares the Lord God. He's going to say that four more times all the way to verse 20. He's going to say, if this and this is this has happened, this judgment is coming, these three men, these three men, if they come to intercession and, and they start praying and they ask for forgiveness, God's saying to Ezekiel, the only one being delivered is themselves, not the rest of the people. You get the picture? That's how bad the nation was. Now look at verse 20 with me. It says almost the same thing. Even though, well, verse 19, if I should bring a plague against the country, pour out my wrath and blood on it, cut off man and beast from it, even though, here it is again, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in its midst. As I live, declares the Lord God, they could not deliver either the son or their daughter. They would deliver only themselves by their righteousness. Now, now look at the two people that he puts in the same paragraph. Do you believe Noah was a real person? Do you believe Daniel was a real person? Why on earth would he include Job if it was just a poetic thing? I think he literally actually lived. Do you understand? There's one other verse. Turn to James in our New Testament where Job is brought up again. And I want to close with this this morning, which we barely got started. But look at the book of James chapter 5. James chapter 5, and I want to just read verse 11. He's talking about challenging the people to be patient when hard times come, when difficulties, when tribulation, when suffering comes. And in verse 15, he says, We count those blessed who endured, who trusted God in the midst of difficulty, who kept on holding on, who kept on trusting now, I want you to understand that is the message of Job. When I can't explain it, it makes no sense. I can't figure it out. Trust God. James is moved by the Holy Spirit to, to use this as an illustration. When we count those blessed who endured, you have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealing. Stop there. Look up here. Take it off, Gretchen. Don't let it be up there. I don't want you to see the rest of the verse. If it just stopped there, knowing what you do know of Job, even if you haven't read it yet, but you've read it before, what would be the dealings of God that you know about Job? Would they be on the high point, the exciting, the success, the spiritual growth, the wonder, the, the blessings, the prosperity? Or would you think about the, the loss, the hurt, the pain, the suffering? Thanks, Reba. She's shaking her head. It's down here that we think that's how God dealt with Job. Now put the verse back up and let's see how James uses it. He's talking about endurance. He's talking about trust. He's talking about holding on in the midst of difficulty. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings. That the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. It doesn't explain why. You're not going to get the why in the book of Job. It's going to push us to who? To in whom are you going to trust? And what that's going to mean is it's going to challenge all of us to get to know him better, to find out about his nature, his character, so that when my circumstances are, are, are blowing me away, I'm drawn to the, to the God who is there and absolutely in control. And we've only 
tip the tip of the iceberg. But I encourage you as you read through, your, you're going to hear about that courtroom scene and, and the permission God gives Satan and, and how Job's family and his, his, his stuff is ravaged. And, and so as we close back in Job, if you'll just put this one back up for us. In Job chapter 1, at the end of the chapter, when he's experienced all the stuff that has taken place, he's lost his family, his kids, he's lost his possessions. There's four servants left that come to give him report. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head. This is verse 20. I'm sorry. Did I say that to you? And shaved his head and he fell to the ground and he worshiped. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I shall return there. The Lord gave. The Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I think we sing that from time to time. He gives and takes away. He gives and takes away. My heart will choose to say, Blessed be your name. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God at this point. There's going to be some interesting dialogue with his friends. And ultimately, as you get to the end, there's going to be a wonderful whirlwind of God working in Job's life and revealing to him a fresh and a new experientially through poetic language so that we can get into this. Where were you, Job, when I made the earth? Can, can you put the stars in place and hold them together, the sun and the moon? Do you know anything about the mountain goat? Do you know anything about the deer when they fall? Do you know anything? And Job, God's not being mean. He's just showing, Job, you're trying to make decisions without knowledge. You are finite. God is saying, I'm infinite. And I'm perfect. And I'm perfectly infinite. And infinitely perfect. Trust me. Father, we need to trust you. As difficult as it is, as hard as it is, through when things don't go our way, when things are hard, when there's disease and pain and suffering, when there's loss, when there's grief, Father, when there's confusion, when there's world disorder and all the stuff going on, Father, draw us back to you, who you are, your nature, your goodness, your mercies that are new every morning. And when we're tempted to, to buy into the, the worldview of the people around us that don't know you, Father, draw us back to you. When the enemy of our faith, Satan himself, wants to bring doubt and fear, when he wants to lie to us and accuse us and he wants to deceive us, Father, we pray for the grace and the strength to see him as a roaring lion trying to devour people and to submit ourselves to you and humble ourselves before you and cast all of our cares on you because you care for us. And Father, may we be loving and kind to our, our loved ones and our friends who are experiencing the difficulty. May we be sensitive to their situations and look to you for the proper timing. May we listen. May we love them. May we hold them. May we pray for them. And Father, in your time, we pray that you would refine all of us so that we trust you even more. We need you, Father. And thank you for your word and the instruction that it is. Continue to change us and draw us closer to Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen.